How does this all affect you personally? Do you, do, does, it, does it hit you? Do, you, do, you, do you? Does it give you sleepless nights? It makes me very sad that I put my life into developing this stuff and that um, it's now extremely dangerous and people aren't taking the dangers seriously enough. Professor, it's great to have you back on Newsnight. What do you think about the way that humans are now competing with different models of AI and are using and abusing your creation? What do you feel about how the humans are behaving? I think it's clear that we need strong regulations on AI. So people are very competitive. We evolved from small warring bands of chimpanzees or our common ancestors with them. And um, we need to stop AI being abused by having government regulations on it. Because you told Faisal here before that you would compare this to the relatively successful Geneva Convention on the use of chemical weapons. The world can cooperate, but we're not in a very cooperative age, are we, Professor? Yes, I think it's unfortunate that this extremely powerful technology is being developed and unleashed on the world at a point at which we uh, seem to be moving towards authoritarian governments. We asked a very well-known AI program to generate a question for you. We said to it, we're going to be interviewing the Nobel laureate Geoffrey Hinton. Uh, what one question would you ask as an AI bot? And the chat response was, given how quickly AI systems are beginning to reason, persuade and act autonomously, what is the single most irreversible mistake humanity could make in the next five years? And what concrete decision would most reduce the risk of that mistake? OK, um, I think there's many mistakes we could make, but I think the biggest mistake we could make is not to do enough research on how we can coexist peacefully with intelligent beings that are more intelligent than ourselves, but that we created. Since we're creating them, we still have a lot of options on how we create them, but we should be very careful because if we create them so they don't care about us, they will probably wipe us out. You can understand it's quite chilling for me to hear you, of all people, the end of your sentence there. Well, we've never been in this situation before of being able to produce things more intelligent than ourselves. We can't do it yet, but nearly all the experts agree that within the next 20 years we will be able to do it. And of course, in many areas, they're already much smarter than us. So we don't know what it's going to be like. And it seems to me very urgent that we do a lot of research on how we can coexist with them and very little efforts being put into that at present. What would you compare it to, the, the threat of this kind? You, you, you seem to see it on the horizon. Well, different experts have different um, time scales for this. So quite a few reasonable experts think it's going to happen in the next few years. I think it'll be more like 10 years. Um, Almost all the experts think that it will happen within 20 years. So that's the sort of timescale we're dealing with. And that's the point at which AI becomes more intelligent than HI, human intelligence. Yes. And it'll not just be more intelligent, but because it's more intelligent, it'll be able to be more persuasive, for example. So the idea that you could just turn it off won't work because it'll be able to persuade the person who should turn it off that that will be a very bad idea. What forms will it take? And will it be hostiles to humans who it don't think are reliable? It's the sort of, in Orwell's literature, there were the proles. Do you think AI could treat millions of us like proles? It depends how we develop it. And I think it could possibly be developed like that. And I think that would be a terrible thing. And that would be to put malice in the software effectively and I don't understand uh, only you can explain how can you take malice out if you've got two competing systems China's doing its version the US is doing its version surely the sort of logical intelligence for them to do is to compete against each other to be better than the other one and possibly to be able to turn the other one off well they will compete against each other in lots of areas um, in things like cyber attacks, in things like lethal autonomous weapons, in things like fake videos for corrupting elections. But there's one area in which they will cooperate, and that is in trying to prevent these things from taking over from people. So at the height of the Cold War, 
the US and the Soviet Union cooperated on trying to prevent a global nuclear war because it wasn't in either of their interests. And if you ask where do the interests of China and the US align, they align in not wanting AI to take over. So there will be international collaboration on that. And I wonder where the first kind of handshake will be. Do you think it's going to have to take a crisis, something that forces humanity to cooperate? If you look at the way we're not cooperating at the moment, we've even got a situation among NATO. They're arguing over the fate of Greenland. I don't, I don't see how we're going to be able to get cooperation that you seek. Um, I think it'll be very hard with the current occupant of the White House. Yes, I mean, that's your, your, your blandest criticism of the US president. Do you think it's because it's going to make some people very rich? You could do a read across to the American oil companies that will be able to pump Venezuelan oil. Do you think that AI, as it's currently programmed, is going to make a lot of people proles poorer and a lot of people billionaires richer? So the large companies are investing huge amounts of money in it. Um, between them, they're investing at the order of a trillion dollars in new data centres and new chips. Um, and maybe they'll even pay for data at some point. But there's, there's only one way I think they can make that money back. They don't think they're going to make it back by subscription fees. They have to replace jobs to make that money back. That's where the big money is in selling companies things that will replace workers. But I don't think they've thought through sufficiently what's going to happen if a very large number of workers get replaced. It's going to be a terrible thing. There's not going to be people to buy things. Um, also, there's going to be extreme social unrest. As you increase the gap between the rich and the poor, you get more violence and more social unrest. So there is a read across as well, because it's not in the interests of President Xi to have a revolt in the Chinese population. So you think that if they understood the risks of making so many people in manual jobs or manual administrative jobs uh, jobless, they might understand the reason to cooperate? Um, yes. So I think the Chinese leadership um, can probably do a better job than the current US leadership, because the Chinese leadership um, is worried about the people who will be unemployed. They're their responsibility. In the US, the big companies think um, if we fire people, um, that's the government's problem, that's not our problem. Um, they're mistaken. If you fire too many people, it's everybody's problem. If I just sum up this section of our time with you, how acute are your concerns now? It's an audience that's very keen to hear from you, but would you like to just put it in a sentence that I can clearly understand how, how much this Nobel laureate is worried. I think we're at a very crucial point in history when we're going to develop things more intelligent than ourselves fairly soon. We haven't done the research to figure out if we can peacefully coexist with them. It's crucial we do that research. What are the big societal shifts that, that are going to be needed in the coming years? Well, it would be great if we could shift back to cooperating democracies. The political system we had in the 1950s was a much better system, the system that um, founded and developed the UN, for example. Um, it was a much better environment for developing AI than what we have now. There was a sort of law in chip processing speed, I think it was called Moore's Law, that chip processing power doubled every three to six months. Do you think we could make one tonight? Can we make a Hinton Law tonight on this programme? Do you think that the developments of AI are going to increase exponentially? Do we see a doubling of a doubling? Um, I don't think it's going to continue to be exponential. It may be exponential for a while. Um, exponentials tend to peter out before they consume the whole universe. Um, so I don't think it'll continue to be exponential, but I think it'll, even if it was just linear, um, it would still be scary. If you look back 10 years, and think, what could AI do 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago, people would have just laughed if you said, we're soon going to have an AI that can answer any question you ask it at the level of a not very good expert. They would have said, that's crazy. That's not coming for a very long time. I would have said that. Um, so that's how things were 10 years ago. 
in the last 10 years, we've made tremendous developments. If progress was just linear and we made the same amount of development in the next 10 years, we'd have things we can hardly imagine now, things that would seem completely crazy. How does this all affect you personally? Do you, do, does, it, does it hit you? Do, you, do, you, do you? Does it give you sleepless nights? It makes me very sad that I put my life into developing this stuff and that um, it's now extremely dangerous and people aren't taking the dangers seriously enough. Do you ever look in the mirror and undevelop it? Do you ever take yourself back? We all have moments in our life which we would undo. Would you undo developing AI? No, I have moments I would undo, but that's not one of them. Um, it would have been developed without me. May I may have sped it up by a week or so, but um, I don't think I made any decisions that I wouldn't make the same way if I had the same knowledge. Professor, so you're very humble. Um, but it does lead me to the optimistic part of our interview because you just told us you wouldn't undo it. What is one of the most fabulous uses you have read about that makes you feel proud? Uses in education, for example. So there's a school in the US, I think it's called the Alpha School. It's expensive because AI is still expensive, but it'll get much cheaper soon, where the students, instead of having lectures in a classroom... Um, spend two hours a day with AI, and that's sufficient to get in all the knowledge that's required in a school. And then the teachers spend their time working on projects and social interactions with the kids, which is a much better use of a teacher's time. So a normal teacher is in broadcast mode in a classroom where they're telling the children the answers to questions the children didn't just wonder about. Whereas with an AI tutor, the AI tutor can always be telling you the answer to questions you did just wonder about, and you learn much faster that way. And I wonder if you're excited about the imaging using in medicine. I'm very excited about that. I made a prediction in 2016, which was somewhat unfortunate. I said, in five years' time, all of these scans will be read by AI. Um, I was off by a factor of two or so, maybe even a factor of three. But it's happening and it's going to be very helpful. We're going to be much better at detecting cancers, for example. Professor, thank you very much for joining us again on Newsnight. Thank you for inviting me.